الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها من نعمة الحمد لله رب العالمين حمد يوافي نعمه ويكافي مزيده اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد مفتاح باب رحمة الله عدن ما في علم الله صلاة وسلام دائمين بدوام ملك الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد نورك الساري ومددك الجاري واجمعنا به في كل طاري وعلى آله وصحبه يا نور اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد صلاة نكون بها محبوبين لك ومحبوبين له وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم نور لنا البصائر وصفي لنا السرائر ووسع لنا المشاهد وصفي لنا الموارد اللهم انظر إلينا يا رب العالمين يا حي يا قيوم يا الرحمن يا الرحيم يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا ودود يا وهاب يا معطي يا فتاح يا عليم يا الله يا إلهي انظر إلينا وإلى هذا المجلس وأهل هذا المجلس وهذا المسجد وهذا المنطقة وإلى أهل أستراليا كلها وإلى المسلمين في المشارك الأرض ومغاربها انظر إليهم يا رب العالمين بعين العناية وعين الهداية وعين الحفظ وعين الرعاية وعين الجود وعين الكرم يا رب العالمين يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين فرجع على المسلمين وهدي قلوبنا يا رب العالمين وينقذ قلوبنا يا رب العالمين ووجه قلوبنا إليك مع كمال العافية والسلامة في الدين والدنيا والآخرة وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله ما شاء الله it's a great honor to be here this evening sharing this space with you all can everybody hear me okay yeah الحمد لله so the title of uh, tonight's exchange is the dawn of mercy. It's a really nice title. Please see me. Come and have a seat up here. Uh, Abu Ahmed, Fadl, please. Fadl, there are two empty spaces. They need to be filled. Imam, please. Fadl, Fadl, Bismillah. Um, so dawn in Arabic is interesting. I mean, we recite this, you know, the first surahs that a child learns growing up is Surah Al-Falaq, Surah Al-Nas, you know, the Ma'udatain. Qul a'udhu bi Rabbil Falaq. And then we also have Wudduha. But the dawn really is, is Fajr. And it's interesting that like Fajr means like an opening also, uh, to something to bloom or come out of something. And it's the sun you know, coming out of the night. And it's a very interesting analogy because it's one which is shared also in the English language. You know, uh, I think Batman, well, we don't want to quote him too much in the masjid, but they said something about like the, the darkest part of the night is before the dawn. Yeah, correct? Stuff like that. Yeah, you don't know. Of course you don't know because you don't watch Batman. Anyway, uh, and then you have the dawn, dawn of mercy. Mercy it's an interesting word, and I think it's, I'd approximate it's a translation of Rahma. But interestingly, we had this reflection on this recently in uh, KL in, in Malaysia. So you have this idea of mercy, but I think also Rahma, we can maybe uh, add in the, the word compassion. Because mercy, I think, is, is appropriate, but also it has this idea that, you know, at the mercy of someone, it's, it's almost like a threat at some level. And, you know, if we're talking, the, what I read from the, from the title is this is about the, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The, the emergence of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, into the world. Um, and it's interesting we use the word dawn because he was, he, you know, he was, like, he was like the sun. That's how the, 
you know, the Sahaba, they tried to attempt to describe him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Was he like the sun or was he like the moon? You know, one of them, they went out and they saw in a, in a full moon and they looked at him. They say, I, I saw somebody, I never saw somebody so more exquisitely beautiful than him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, dressed in these two red garbs, which they say it's not red but in its entirety, but it has this, its khat, this kind of lined in red. And he was like they were in, in, in the ihram, but it was colored and hajj. They say, I looked to him and it was the night of the full moon. And then I looked to the full moon. And then I looked to him, and then I looked to the full moon. And they said that his face was, it was, it was overwhelming because it was more radiant than the full moon. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They actually say that when he went to Medina, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, there were miraculous things that started to happen, that even the trees, they said, Medina Munawwara, this isn't just figurative. There were some, some times within the seerah that this light would actually be a sign of his prophecy and the trees would start to like glisten, you know, which didn't happen prior to him coming to Medina. It was through him that it became munawwara, that it became illuminated. And he was, he's the source of illumination, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, when he was born, as we know, one of the miraculous events is the, 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 the castles of, in, in, the, in the Persian Empire were illuminated and lit. This is one of the signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, changed in the normal realm of his physics within the world in order to, sh to show who this person was and his magnitude and his grandeur and his greatness, sallallahu uh, alayhi wa I've been told that we're going to be reflecting this evening in the, the brief but inshallah blessed moments that we have about the early um, part of the seerah, which is the, the, the prophetic biography. Now, I think we can start, you know, at, at the emergence of prophecy. But the Prophet Wasallam, even his birth was miraculous. You know, the, even prior to his birth, I mean, his mother Amina, she would see dreams of all of the Prophets coming to him. And she knew who he was, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, and when, when she was dying, she, you know, on her way back from Medina, uh, the Prophet Wasallam was by, by her side. And, she, she started to recite this poetry, which just shows the sophistication of the society, that they're able to break out into this exquisite poetry. And she started to say, you know, Barakallahu fika ya ghulami, may Allah bless you, my young boy. And she, you know, because, fa'anta mab'uthan lil anami, because you, you are sent forth to, to people. You know, and she knew who he was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And, uh, you know, you know, there are many instances, as we know, that when he went to Halima to Sa'diyya, because she was actually late, and all the women came, you know, riding on donkeys from the Badia, from the kind of outskirts of Mecca, because it was the custom and the practice of the people in Mecca to send their new newborn children out to these outskirts, because the, the air was cleaner, and they also hoped that they would be trained and learn classical uh, Arabic, you know, in the classical Arabic tongue. The people of the city, it's all, you know, there's always uh, people who get, uh, it, it's different, the environment is different. So, you know, as was the tradition, this group of people came and they came seeking the, pro the, uh, the, the young people, of, of the young boys and girls of, Med of, of Mecca. And uh, uh, Halima, she was on this like old decrepit donkey, it was just like practically useless. And she was reciting, people kind of looking at this poor thing, like, you know, trottle along, and, and everyone was racing on to Mecca. And by the time she'd arrived, Allah had willed it that, like, there was no other child left ap apart from Sayyidina Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And nobody wanted him because he was yatim. He didn't have a father, and they would go and they would witness the children of Mecca, and for a fee. Uh, so she came to the Prophet and she said, when I looked at him, his face just started to beam with light. My heart naturally inclined towards him. You know, so I, I took him and my husband, and she said that, you know, uh, that we started to, that hope there would be blessing out of this young boy. We just start to find blessing in this young boy. So on the way back, the first blessing was that the, the donkey became like, like supercharged to such an extent that the people that preceded her were overtaken by her and they were like, is that Halima? Like on that thing? Like what's up, what's up with the donkey? You know? 
and uh, she charged back to, to Mecca. And they said that because of the drought, that her, her milk was, was very, always very scarce and, scarce, and they had a, she, the Prophet she said, had a, a brother through wet nursing. And uh, they said that like milk started to flow when the Prophet was placed at the breast. And what was interesting, when she started to feed the Prophet on the right hand side, when she put him to the left hand side, he refused. And they said this was this inherent adil, this like fairness which he was created with. This was his, his brother's. You know, and he would refuse to, 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 to receive from that. It was amazing, like the, the Ainaya, the kind of divine inspiration which was there, you know, even as a young child. You know. And we know that so much took place, you know, with the, with the opening of the chest and the, this, all these miraculous events. Now, if we fast forward somewhat, you know, everyone in Mecca knew him as a Sadiq al Amin, you know, Sadiq, the person of, of immense integrity and honesty and truthfulness and trustworthiness. They would place their amanet, their trusts, with him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because he was the furthest of people from khiyana, this kind of you know absence of trust and honesty. So, when the message first came and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was ordered to to proclaim this, uh, he went to this. You know, they say it was the greatest kind of. Um, expression of social media at the time. It was the way to kind of get the message to as many people as possible, which was the, mount, the, the mountain. And this is what they would do is typically if there was a, an army coming or some kind of calamity, some kind of tragedy, and they had to get the message out to everyone, they would stand on this mountain and call people. Call people. And the Prophet Sallam, did this. And then the people gathered around and he said, like, oh Quraysh, if I was to warn you, that there, is a mount, that, that there is an army which is imminently marching towards you behind this mountain, would you believe me? And they said, they said, of course we believe you. We've never known you to lie. And then he said, then know that I'm a prophet unto you, and I call to the oneness of God, and I come to you to, warn, to, to give you glad tidings and to warn you of an imminent danger if you do not receive this. And they said, they said this is... We don't believe, you know. And uh, this is when Abu Lahab, he said, uh, you know, when your hands perish, it's like an Arabic curse. Like, you've, you've gathered us for this, why are you wasting our time? You know, and, the, and that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse, Tabbat yada Abi Lahab in Watab. You know, may the hands of Abu Lahab perish. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't, uh, don't curse Habibi, my beloved, else we'll, we'll move in and uh, out of recompense. And retribution. So this was the first stage. Now the first part of amongst the Sahaba was 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 sir. It was it was in secret. The dawa was secretive, meaning it wasn't as they they were um, they were keeping it to themselves or it was exclusively exclusivist. But it wasn't an outward public proclamation. So what they would do is they would meet in the living rooms of Mecca, in Dar al Arqam, and they would sit and the Prophet Sallallahu would just give out this light, this illumination. And all the people would sit around the Prophet and listen to the very early teachings of Islam. And he was, he was building people. He was you know, cultivating people. And the, you know, about what it means to have now a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what are the implications of this. So in these very early, early times, this is where uh, the dawn of this mercy started to take place. Now what's interesting is uh, you have what's called in Arabic Al-Fajr and kathib and Al-Fajr al-Sadiq. This is um, you learn in, in, typically within the realms of fiqh because it's to do with the entry point for the Fajr prayer. So you have the Fajr uh, and kathib which is actually interesting. We never get this in Manchester because it's always so grey and cloudy. But it's such a wonderful clear night. I wonder if you can see this here in Brisbane. So you have, and typically the Fajr al kadhib is this one straight projection of light. It just goes up and then it fades. You can't pray Fajr in this time. And then you have the Fajr al-Sadiq, which starts out with a small kind of illumination on the horizon and it starts to spread out um, horizontally and, until, you know, Ishraq. That's the real Fajr. And they talk about this often as an, an, an analogy. The Prophet وسلم, was the true dawn. And what he was doing, sallallahu alaihi was what was being radiating towards people was, was a true path to get back 
to the one that created them. And we're still basking in that radiance, that's a reality, because everything that we have is from him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, we only know la ilaha illallah because of Muhammad rasulullah We only know the prayer because of him. We're sat in a masjid now. Like, we only know the realities of the masjid because of him. It's all about him. You know, and this is why we have to really understand the, the, the centrality of Rasulullah sallallahu in everything that we do. I mean, the prayer is really a ce celebration of Him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because it's only so beloved to Allah, it's only so meaningful to Allah, because that's how Rasulullah sallallahu used to prostrate, that's how Rasulullah sallallahu used to bow, that's how he used to stand, and obviously this was prescribed and inspired by Allah to him, but he was the model, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was the greatest one that ever devoted themselves to Allah subhanahu wa taala. So in this early stage, it was, it was very challenging because the difficulties uh, which, was face, which were faced by these early Sahaba, these early companions around the Prophet were incredible, you know, very, very intense. I mean, you have the likes of Sayyidina, the family of uh, Sayyidina Ammar bin Yasir, which were tortured you know, publicly to make a, to make a stance. Like, you, want, you want to follow this? Then this is what we'll make of you. And what they did is they, they brought him out, and there was no there was re, there was no mercy. I mean, it was a brutal kind of uh, you know talk about human rights in a contemporary vernacular. This was absolute you know the worst forms of uh, religious persecution, and this is what the Sahaba experienced. And this wasn't just related to, to the men. I mean, there were the women, there were children that were abused, and you know, the first martyr, true authentic martyr of Islam, was the mother of Yasser uh, of Ammar, uh, Sumaya. She was, she was brutally tortured to, to the point that she lost her life. SubhanAllah. You know, but it just shows as well what those people, what were they tasting in order to lose their life for, you know, you know what a sacrifice to give up one's soul for the sake of the deen. But this was an inauthentic path. And what were they tasting? What did she taste? What was she experiencing? You know, this was something which was very, very profound. And all of the Sahaba experienced this. You know, and when they went to Ammar, because he came to the Prophet Sallallahu and he said, you know, he was weeping and he couldn't look the Prophet in the eye. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi dried his tears and he said, why are you crying? Yeah, Ammar. And he said, yeah, Rasulullah, they killed my parents, you know, and I couldn't take it. And he said, what, what did you say? And he said, like, when they told me to declare, you know, the existence of their gods, I relinquished. I couldn't say no. And the Prophet he said, how did you find your heart? He said, I find my heart disbelieving in this. And my heart was tranquil to, to the realities of Tawheed. I only declare, my belief is that there's only one God, La ilaha illallah. And then the verse was revealed in terms of the, the person is not taken into account if they're coerced, if they're forced into do this. There's a, there's a dispensation in the sacred law. There's a permissibility if you're forced to do it and your heart is tranquil and in a state of ease to Iman. And however, this is something which is really heavy upon the early Sahaba. Sayyidina Bilal, you know, the Sahaba when he was, you know, many years later, they used to weep when they'd look at him, the back of Bilal, and all of the whip marks which he used to take, which was etched into his back for the sake of Islam. You know, and they asked him, they said, you know, because they took him out to the, Batha Mecca, which is the, the Mecca is one of the hot land in the books of fiqh. If they're talking about, uh, they want to give an example of a hot land, a hot arid land. Um, it's typically it's to do with like uh, burial rites, so how you dig a grave, because the la the land is very either very um, malleable or it's very hard. And it, the the two examples that they give is Mecca or Hadramaut, as hot arid lands. So in Mecca, it was incredibly hot. And they took them out to the hottest part on the outskirts of the city in order to inflict the maximum amount of torture. And what they did is they laid him out on the stones, which were heated, and then they placed like a giant, like a boulder on top of him, and then they would push it down. They would whip him, they would stretch him, they were all sorts of... Torture that we can't even imagine, you know. And Sayyidina Bilal was just in a habra. He just went into this deep state of zikr. Ahad, 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 Ahad. He was just declaring the oneness of Allah. Years later, when they saw this, they said, "How could you have taken the pain? Like, how did you, how did you last? 
you know. And he said, whilst the pain was bitter, there was nothing worse. Allah inspired me to start to remember him and, and be present with him. And this, this gave a sweetness to the very core of my soul. And when that was mixed with the bitterness of pain, it outweighed it, it like it, it made it sweet. I mean, that is just a profound, you know, state. Sayyidina Bilal, radiallahu anhu. You know, when Umar, who was this blue-blooded blooded Qurayshi, initially very arrogant, you know, and uh, he would, when he was, he described Bilal, he did it in the most honorific of terms. He said, "Who was Sayyiduna?" When he, Afwan, when he described Sayyidina Abu Bakr, he would say, "Who was Sayyiduna? Ataqa Sayyidina." Abu Bakr is our master who freed our master. Who was the master which Abu Bakr freed? Sayyidina Bilal. Mm. You know, radiallahu anhu. They climbed to the symbolically to the top of the Kaaba and gave the call to Islam. You know, and you know those they're not the same. Allah says those which became you know Aslam min qabl al fath they became Muslim before the opening, meaning the conquest of Mecca, and those which came after because of what they experienced, what they had to go through. The Prophet وسلم, after the three years, and there was this, uh, you know, what the the, the came from, the command from Allah came to now pronounce and proclaim this message to inform people publicly about the reality of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. You know, this is when the things really started to intensify. The Prophet ﷺ came to the Kaaba and Sayyidina Abu Bakr found him and they were beating the Prophet ﷺ around the Kaaba. And they, um, Abu Bakr just threw himself in. There was no Abu Bakr, khalas. He was just, in su had such love and like, you know, it's like a father to his son or a mother to their child. They don't see themselves and it's a very unique form of love which promotes such a selflessness that you don't even care about your own self. You'll sacrifice yourself for the sake of that person. And that's what Abu Bakr had for Rasulullah So he came, he threw himself in, and they said they beat him so severely, you couldn't, you know, because the, the nose obviously is projected in the face. The, the remainder of his face was in line with his nose. It was so swollen. It's irrecognizable. His own mother, initially, when she, she looked at this, she came to find him, she couldn't recognize him. Because his face was so small, swollen, and they practically, they almost killed him. And then out of, uh, uh, she said, بِحُقُمَ الْقَبَلِيَ This kind of tribalism which the early Arabs had. His tribe went to him, and they tried to rescue him, and they took him to the house. You know? And when he, when he eventually came to con out of consciousness, they said, do you want to eat something? He said, how's Rasulullah? Oh. SubhanAllah. Like, there was no even recognition, or like, you know, just have a go, have some water, have just... How is Rasulullah? And they said, just eat first. He said, no, tell me how he is. He said, he's fine. You know, and then they left him because they said, like, there's no, no hope for this guy. Because like, they were still, they weren't Muslim. This is one of the reasons for the mother of Abu Bakr to become Muslim. Because, you know, a mother knows her son. So when a mother sees that in her own son, this, I mean, that's like something very profound going on. You know, that, doesn't, that can't be faked. You know, when this happened, you know, she said, la, la. This is real, like you know, I this can't this is this is absolutely real. You know. You have the example also, um, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, was 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 and, and the, the early believers in the tribes of Bani Hashim were banished, like literally extradited. You know, and this is all in the space of this dawn, you know, like the Prophet came and this dawn, you know, was was taking place in the hearts of the, the Sahaba and you know uh, but it was under, you know, immense tribulation. You know, we, we, we often talk about it's very hard for the Muslims now. Which one of us have been tortured in such a way of Sayyidina Bilal? Which one of us have gone through that which, you know, to see one's own mother speared to death? And it's not, it's somewhat graphic, but this is a reality of what took place with those early peoples. You know, none of us have experienced this. You know, to be extradited, you're not allowed to marry from them, you're not allowed to trade with them, you're not allowed to do anything with them. And they were literally excommunicated, there was an embargo. And the, you know, the, the scholars, they say this is the only form of embargo, it's not with... Uh, the, the, it, the, the embargo, it, it's not part of a prophetic tradition. You'll never see any of the prophets um, stopping water or food supplies, even to the enemy. This is why it's haram to cut down a tree or to poison the water, even in an active 
legislated, legal, genuine, non-vigilante uh, state of martial engagement, martial combat. You know, it, it's absolutely haram to do this because this is outside of the rules of futua and, and active engagement. So, you know, however they did this to the early generation, and the only thing which softened them was they could hear the screams of the children crying out of hunger and starvation after two years of being in the outskirts of Mecca. That's what softened the hearts of the disbelieving Quraysh. So they invited them back, but it just became so difficult. Things became so difficult that the Prophet ﷺ gave the, um, the izan, the, the authority, for the, a group of the Sahaba to go to Abyssinia, Habasha, Ethiopia, and East Africa. So they went, and there's this incredible example and analogy for you know, Muslims living as minorities. Because what was interesting is um, the Quraysh got wind of this and sent some of their kind of the people, uh, uh, Amr, Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As, before he became Muslim with one of his friends. And he had like, you know, he was in with the kind of the king of Abyssinia. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, he said, you'll find a king there who does not wrong anyone. He's a just person, even though he's Christian. Which just shows that not all non-Muslims, quote unquote, are the same. You know, it's, it's this kind of like cartoon style reality which many Muslims find. You know, the good guys and the bad guys, the cops and the robbers, often human souls are not like that, they're nuanced. And we have to recognize this, you know. And the Prophet Sissam recognized this. He said, you go to this land and you'll find a king who does not wrong anyone. So they went there. And the story is well known, like, you know, uh, he said that, you know, he summoned the Muslims. He said, these people are causing havoc in our own lands and that, you know, they're, they're, they're ruining our culture, their cultural traitors and uh, you know because these things are inherited just as you have prophetic inheritance people that embody the living tradition of prophecy you also have the inheritors of abu lahab you have the inheritors of abu jahl you know and their, their state is is reciprocated throughout time and space they may be wearing a three-piece suit or they may be wear, speaking in a slightly different vernacular but that state is still there that kind of enmity and hatred but how did the Prophet وسلم, and the early Sahaba deal with this? That's what we've got to look into. So when they went there, um, you know, the, the Quraysh came with gifts and gave them to all the wuzara, all of the people around the king. So they were basically being bribed to say something, you know. And, uh, you know, they came spreading fake news. And uh, they said, you know, they're doing all these kind of problems in you know where they're from. They're going against our culture. This is they're reaping havoc. You know you shouldn't let them stay in your land. And you know, you know, the king said, "Well, I've heard what you have to say, and it's only right for me to hear what they have to say." Justice. Like it shows the fairness. And they said, "What do you have to say?" They said, "Our prophet came, and we were a people in in complete disarray, ignorance." We would bury our children, our, our female children, alive. And we would wrong people who were weak. And he came with a message of love and a message of kindness and a message of, of justice and fairness. And he, he sent us to you and, and he said that you were, you, you were a fair king. And the, the, the king started to like be intrigued by this at this point. He said, yeah, but they, you know, and they were trying to like, you know, just cause problems. They said like, but you know, they say a foul thing about, about Jesus. He said, well, they've, they, they've honored me by saying that I'm a person of fairness. So it's only appropriate for me to hear now what they say. And he said, what do you say about Jesus, Isa? And he said, and, you, and Sayyidina Ja'far, I've been, I've been, uh, Ibn uh, Abi Talib, the cousin of the Prophet, he said, will you pronounce it? Like, look at the edip, look at the manners. Like, they weren't like, well, we're right and you're in haq and you're just some kafir. And they just, that, wasn't the, that wasn't their dawah. They said, will you permit me, like, allow me to recite some of our revealed book, the Quran? Look, look at the edip. You know, and, and, he, and he said, yeah, rukhsa, bismillah. He started to recite. Can you imagine hearing this? Is, they would have heard this firsthand. It was fresh. 
from the Prophet and he started to read, recite the beginning of Surah to Maryam. Kafaya Ain Sad. And, 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 and until the point when it talks about Sayyidina Isa, Jesus, and, it, and it's so profound. I mean, Jesus, as we know, is mentioned far more times than in the Prophet and in the Quran. Many Christians don't know this. And, and it, it's so incredible the way it talks about so the miraculous birth. And the king was so moved, he started to, he was overwhelmed, he started to flood with tears. And uh, he, he pulled out a stick and he said, like, the difference between us and them is no different than the length of this stick. Uh, you can go, go back, and by the way, take all the gifts which you've bribed my, bribed my courtiers with, you know, off you pop back to Mecca. He said, they're able to stay here, and not only that, they're under my protectorate. And so this is one of the first examples of a Muslim minority, and they maintained their identity, you know, but they weren't, uh, you know, they were respectful in the lands which they lived in. So this is still within the very early part of the seerah. News came back that things had become, once again, fake news had gotten back to them, that things in Mecca had calmed down. When they went, so they came back from Abyssinia and came back and found that actually, in fact, things had gotten far, far worse. And they were like, well, now what do we do? So many of them were, you know, you know, experienced the difficulties. And that's why you have, and you have the second hijrah when they were sent back to Abyssinia. So all of this was in the context of um, incredible difficulty. You really had to want to be Muslim. There was no real kind of outward thing keeping you in Islam. There wasn't any kind of uh, patronage or you know, reimbursement or you know, free biryani. It was, you know, it was really you had to, it was very, very challenging to be a Muslim in that time. You know, literally it was life or death. It had a social impact. And all of these challenges started to take place within the realms of this dawn. So it's interesting, you know, whilst we often think that everything's hunky-dory, but in the most pinnacle moment in human history, which is the dawn, the, the emergence of the Prophet it's coupled with such a time of, 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 of challenge and difficulty. You know, SubhanAllah. The most beloved of, you, you know, of people to Allah are those which are most tested. Either ahab Allahu abdin yabtali, if Allah but loves a person, a servant of his, he tests them. You know, and if you look at in the life of the Rasulullah and how this took place. And then we have Ta'if. And the Prophet it was so challenging the things in Mecca, the Prophet went to seek support from the people of Ta'if, which was a village uh, outside of Mecca. The people had gotten wind of his his um, visit. And what they'd actually done is they'd literally recruited all of the kind of like the, the youth and the kind of the people of, of weakness within the society, some like people that maybe they weren't quite sound of mind, and they'd hired them, they'd bribed them to stand on either side of the road of the entry into Taif. So when the Prophet came, they were awaiting him, but it wasn't an awaiting of celebration, it was one of mockery. They, 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 they'd actually preempted this kind of, uh, you know, reception of the Prophet <laughs> Now, as we know, the Prophet um, uh, they didn't even allow, permit him to, 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 to converse with them, which is just so like, I was a bit like, you know, there was just no, there wasn't even, you know, just to hear someone out. They weren't even willing to do this. What they did, in fact, is they ordered the people to, um, to stone the Prophet And they'd, they'd orchestrated this, um, that, and he was with Sayyidina Zaid uh, bin Harith, that when, when, when the people at one side of this, 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 this roadway into Taif uh, threw stones at him, obviously, naturally, he would he would fall towards the other side. And they, they told the people, if he falls down, hoist him back up. Like, it's just relentless. So they picked him back up, and, and they, they like to throw him back in to, like, to, to you know, throw more stones at him. And the Prophet would, would stop sometimes out of exhaustion now and out of the pain. And they said that part of his the description is the sinew in his ankle was very, it was short, it was very like muscular, and they would throw. And it, and it cut his, his feet, and they said that blood was flowing in his, in his shoes. 
and they would hoist him out and uh, Sayyidina Zaid, he would, he would go around him, try and cloak the Prophet him, to protect him. Like he'd rather that they, they stoned him rather than the Prophet him. This didn't take place. Now the Prophet him, went out of Ta'if and came into a bustan, you could say like an orchard. And the first thing the Prophet him, did was to engage in prayer. I mean, all of this, everything in the seerah, it's been divine, it's like a divine tapestry that's been woven together so that we understand the Prophet We understand how to approach challenges in our lives, what to do, how to react, how to respond. And the first thing he did was to turn back to Allah. And the first thing he said was not of Allah, like, look what they've done to me. Look at these kuffar, look at these people, look at the... No, this wasn't his way. No. He said, Allahumma inni ashku ilayka ba'afi. Oh Allah, I complain to you about my own weakness. Wa qillata hilati. And my, just the, the, the weakness of my plan, like... Wa hawani ala nas. And my insignificance in the sight of people. And he didn't say, look at, look at the adab. He didn't say, and that they see me as insignificant. My insignificance in the sight of people. But if, if, if you're, you know, if you're not angry with me, like if this is not a sign that you're upset with me, for that or barely, like, then this is no, of no concern to me. Like I'll take whatever you want. Like, because my, my heart is with you. I'm doing this for you. For that or barely. And then out of his humility, his humility he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, However, like, for me to be in a good, healthy, like, easy state, it's, it's, it's easier for me. And he prayed and he prayed and he prayed, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When um, it happened to be that he was in an, in an orchard which belonged to some of the members of Quraysh, and they had a young person that was working, was working for them, and uh, a young Christian man. And he came up to him, and they saw him, and they said, "Isn't this the one that has been causing problems in, in in our hometown of Mecca?" He said, "But he looks in a difficult state. So just out of, you know, Allah caused their hearts to be softened." They said, "Take some grapes and give it to him." So they ordered this young man to go to him. And he came up to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they said, "I've been given this from the person that's commissioned me to work here as a gift to you." And the Prophet him, took it and he said, Bismillah. And the young man turned to him and he said, What did you just say? And he said, Bismillah, in the name of Allah. And he said, I don't hear people around here saying this. And the Prophet him, smiled and he said, Where are you from? And he said, I'm from, I'm obviously in that time, it's in the region which is in uh, Iraq. And the Prophet him, said, oh, this is, this is the land of my brother Yunus. And he said, you know Yunus? And he said, this is my brother in prophecy. And, he said, and, then, and then the man was just overwhelmed. And he came back uh, to the people and, and he was just like, you know, in awe of this, the light of the Prophet wasalam. And they said, I hope you haven't been influenced by this man. Like, you, you better get back to work. And they said, get out of He said, this is craziness. This is, this is a fitna. Sometimes people can be at the cusp of guidance and you have someone to move in and just blocks that guidance. Now, after all of this, all of these challenges, all of these difficulties, you know, the first thing that Allah, Allah did to take care of his beloved, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was the Prophet him on the way back? Because we got this idea that Mecca to the Taif was just like a five minute walk. You know, the Prophet him walked back and it was through the night and he rested on the retreat and he started to recite the Quran. And then what happened? The jinn started to come around. All of the jinn started to come around. Quran and Ajaba. We've heard this amazing recital. Like, what, this is, what is, this, is this about? This is where Surat and Jinn it refers to this moment. You know. Some of the people of insight, they say, this is Allah saying, Ya Habibi, if the people, if the humankind are not going to believe in you, then we'll have the jinn believe in you, but like, you'll never be neglected. Yeah, and that's when many of the jinn became Muslim. 
Now straight after that was what? Laylatul Isra wal Mi'raj. And they say in terms of the haqq of the Prophet in relation to the Prophet this was the greatest greatest time, the greatest moment of his entire life In terms of his ummah, the greatest day of the ummah was uh, when the Prophet was born. And his, this dawn, this emergence into, into, you know, into the world, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, Laylatul Isra wal Mi'raj was just this epic, you know, reality which took place. You know, and this is where we received the prayer. And they say this is why the Salah Mi'raj and Mu'min, uh, the 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 prayer, if it's prayed properly, is access into this ascension. You know. Of the believer, and this was received directly by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. The salah is your sila, it's your relationship back to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. This great opportunity to reconnect and to meet and go back to Allah five, not only once but five times a day. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. And there were so many examples of this, and this is where the Prophet Sallallahu started to speak to the people of Medina to Munawwara. They came and you have Bayat al Aqaba, the first bay'ah. And this was all preparation for the Prophet ﷺ to come to Medina to Munawara. This great body of people which were now and will always be known. They were known as Aws al Khazraj, but now they're known as the Ansar. Mm. Those people which gave victory to Rasulullah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. So that was the dawn and that was a very, a very brief summation of the, the very early part of the seer of our, of our Prophet. ﷺ. And we have to understand this was orchestrated by a divine hand. This wasn't just, there was nothing haphazard because the Messenger وسلم, is the message. And if we don't know how to read him, then we will not understand our faith. We will not understand Islam. It's that profound. Like, the more we know about him, the more we love him. The more we don't know about him, the more that we'll find ourselves in disarray. And our approach to Islam will be weak and it will, it will be very, very challenging, very dry at best. But we need an attachment which is from the soul. You know, is it not the heart? This is the central point. You know, if we find this, that we allow this, this dawn, this fajr as sadiq to take place in our heart, this light to radiate in our heart, by learning about him, sallallahu alayhi wa and how practically it implies to every single one of our lives. Because he was an example for everyone, and he is an example for everyone, sallallahu alayhi wa then we start to understand the profundity of our deen, we start to have reconnect to our deen, we understand how beautiful it is, we understand how transformative it can become to connect to authentic knowledge through Senad. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, through these brief moments of exchange, uh, illuminate our hearts with that great, that great light, that great sun, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, shams is shamus, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, Habib Ali Habshi, one of the great Imams of Hadar al Mawti, wrote a sign. He goes, he goes, Our son, like our son, like never sets, and it will, you know, it, it will not set. This is a light which we talk about the light of, of Ma'rifa. When it illuminates in the heart, it never goes. Because when the Prophet said, part of his Sunnah is what, if he would turn to you, he would turn with his entirety. Like he wouldn't just turn like this, he would turn with his entire being. Doing it. And this is a reality which still takes place. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he turns to us tonight, that we may turn to him. He engages with us tonight, that we may re-engage with him. That he takes us by the hand, that we may turn back to him in every moment, in every breath, in every heartbeat, in, a heartbeat, in everything that we do. He makes us people of purpose. Replenish our hearts to become people of meaning, people of sincerity, people of dignity, people of integrity, people that follow in the way of the Prophet Sallallahu inwardly and outwardly, to be people of kindness, people of compassion, and people that understand what the meaning of this dawn is and what the meaning of mercy is, to be people of compassion to those closest to us, not just to put on a face to those on the outside, to our wives, to our husbands, to our children, to our parents, to all members of society. You know, in devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah bless you. Forgive me if I went over time slightly. Uh, it's been a great honor to be here and share this space in this blessed mosque with you all. May Allah bless uh, uh, Imam and everyone on the committee, uh, Abu Sidi Abu Ahmed, and all of these great, you know, all of you great people, which, you know, you, you had a choice to be here or not tonight. 
but you made an active decision to be here. And that's because Allah thrust something in your heart to be here. Because if it were not for Allah, none of us would be here. And Allah doesn't invite someone to his house other than he wants to give. Because upon the tongue of his Prophet, he said, that the one that believes in Allah on the last day, honor his guest. And this is Baytullah. This is the house of Allah. And Allah is more willing to honor his guest. So may Allah honor us tonight with gifts you know, and fulfill any of our needs, uh, alleviate and lift and ease and facilitate solutions to any of our problems or challenges or difficulties in our lives. May Allah fill our hearts with, with light, illuminate our hearts with light and allow that light, to, that light to increase and allow that seed to be placed that it blossoms and reaches fruition so we become conduits of khayr and goodness and compassion to everyone around us. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.